at long last, after a red flag that lasted more than 72 hours, the NASCAR Cup Series was able to wrap up their race at Texas, and it was a nail biter. How's it going y'all? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. I appreciate y'all sticking with me. My whole schedule this week has basically been uprooted because of the Texas delay that seemed to never end. But the checkered flag finally flew last night. We're gonna talk all about it. We're gonna talk about the winner. We're gonna talk about how the point situation has changed. We're gonna talk about the favorites and the guys who are in trouble heading into Martinsville this weekend. And of course, we'll put Texas on the ever infamous groovy gauge. But first we have to thank our newest sponsor. Actually, it's a new old sponsor. They're one of the first sponsors of Out of the Groove. Joe's Hand Cleaner, as you can see, is back. And They've sent me some more of their Joe's Hand Cleaner Hand and Surface Wipes with that delicious cherry scent. Gosh, if I just keep these in my car, I don't need an air freshener. Joe's is also known for their all-purpose waterless hand cleaner. Joe's Hand Cleaner is a proud American company based in Oklahoma. They actually sponsor a lot of racetracks in the Oklahoma area. Very clean and fresh smelling. It's available at O'Reilly Auto Parts, Fastenal, and Parts Plus. You can visit their website in the description to learn more. Thank you to Joe's Hand Cleaner for once again stepping up and sponsoring Out of the Groove and supporting racing. You know, they may make a movie one day or like an ESPN 30 for 30 you know if ESPN ever talks about NASCAR again but you know what I'm saying I feel like there's gonna be a documentary or one hell of a YouTube video made in a number of years about this weekend at Texas that seemingly never ended I mean hey Texas is a great state I was born and raised in Texas what's not to love about Texas but I'm sure after one two three four and in some cases I saw Corey LaJoy tweet it last night he had to spend an extra night in Texas because the plane apparently broke down five nights however many nights it was after all this time spent in Texas I'm sure many within the NASCAR industry are happy to be out of the Lone Star State. But there's one man who is leaving extremely happy, maybe for the first real time all season long. Kyle Busch snapped his winless streak. He extends his career-long streak of winning at least one race in every single full-time season. He has now won in all 16 of his full-time NASCAR Cup Series seasons, a feat that has only been matched by some of the greats. They mentioned on the broadcast, guys like Richard Petty, David Pierce, Jimmy Johnson, Ricky Rudd, and more, of course, uh, but a very impressive feat for Kyle Busch, one that he clearly cared a lot about, so much so that he forgot to do his signature bow until Parker Kligerman reminded him during his post-race interview. But yes, Kyle Busch uh, had a smile on his face for maybe the first time all season long. That's a great place to start. Let's talk about the finish because Kyle Busch winning, while it's important to him, really fun for a lot of rowdy nation, hardcore Kyle Busch fans who haven't had a whole lot to celebrate this season, it does doesn't really affect the playoffs. Well, I guess it, it doesn't, and it also does at the same time, because the guy who finished second was Kyle Busch's teammate, Martin Truex Jr. The final run of this race turned into a fuel mileage race. Pretty much the entirety of stage three went caution free, so the leaders were trying to get the most out of not only their tires, but most importantly, their fuel mileage. And Kyle Busch was on that hairy edge of running out of fuel those final 60 plus laps. It was actually really interesting listening to Kyle Busch's radio, how he and his crew chief, really just his crew chief, Adam Stevens, was doing all the talking pretty much every single lap. He was feeding Kyle Busch information, you know, what the gap was back to second place so Kyle Busch could save some fuel there. When Clint Boyer was leading, who was on a completely different strategy, you know, his Adam Stevens was reminding Kyle Busch that they weren't racing Clint Boyer. You could let him go by, things like that. But ultimately, they got the job done. Kyle Busch ran out of fuel as he came back around the front stretch to do his burnout. So he had just enough to make it to the checkered flag. But his teammate, Martin Truex Jr., who is still in the championship hunt, still in the playoffs, and is in desperate need of a victory given his current point situation and the penalty that he was assessed earlier in the weekend. Truex finished just a few car lengths behind Kyle Busch. He really could have used that win. So I guess in that way, Kyle Busch holding on to the lead and saving enough fuel did have pretty major playoff implications because if Martin Truex Jr. had won last night, that would have completely blown up the playoff bubble. Now, before we look at the top finishers and then look at the points, I want to give a shout out to Christopher Bell and Levine Family Racing running a special throwback paint scheme to the first paint scheme Levine ever ran back in 2011, which was actually at Texas Motor Speedway. Levine Family Racing, Bob Levine, is from Texas. His business that he's used to help fund this race team is located in Texas, less than a couple hours from Texas Motor Speedway, I believe. So really cool that in their final start at their home track at Texas Motor Speedway, Levine Family Racing's current sponsors, allowed them to run that throwback scheme and rookie driver Christopher Bell almost got the job done. He ended up finishing third, but he was putting some serious pressure on Martin Truex Jr. and Kyle Busch late in the final stage. I thought for a second we were going to get one of the coolest victories in recent NASCAR memory with just all the Texas written all over it. I thought for a second Christopher Bell had a shot, but his car faded at the end there and he really wasn't a factor at the very end of this race, but certainly put the pressure on. Wanted to give Christopher Bell and Levine Family Racing a shout out. That car looked 
awesome running in the top five. You know, back in 2011, when they were, you know, basically a starting park team, <laughs> didn't see that paint scheme run in the top five ever. <laughs> so pretty neat to see Levine Family Racing run extremely well at their home track here in their final Texas start. But now let's look at the top finishers and let's go down the list and focus mainly on some of the playoff guys. I do want to mention one more thing when I talk about Kyle Busch. Obviously the season has not gone as the defending champion was hoping, but there have been some rumors and rumblings in recent weeks that perhaps Kyle Busch and longtime crew chief, I say long time, they've been together now six years, Adam Stevens, might get split up at the end of this season. Kyle Busch early in his career sort of had a reputation for not being the easiest driver in the world to get along with. He went through a lot of different crew chiefs and well, it wasn't until he found Adam Stevens in 2015 that he started winning championships. Obviously in 15 and last year in 2019, he's won now two championships with Adam Stevens as his crew chief. With some of these rumors recently, I, I thought people were being a little hasty. I understand this year has not been great. They've still been competitive. They just haven't been typical Kyle Busch competitive. I thought people were being a little quick to try and split these two up because because I don't think you're going to find another top-notch crew chief that can handle Kyle Busch's colorful personality, especially now that Joe Gibbs Racing has lost Rudy Fugel, a guy who has worked with Kyle Busch and had success in trucks before, to Hendrick Motorsports. So uh, with that all being said, I would think after the way they communicated at the end of this race, the way Adam Stevens was able to call this race as effectively as he was, he was able to give Kyle Busch just the right amount of fuel. Kyle Busch was able to listen to him and manage the fuel at the end there. I thought they worked together phenomenally at the end of this race. So I would hope that would convince Joe Gibbs Racing to keep Adam Stevens and Kyle Busch together at least for another season. I think that would be the right call. Call. We'll see if it happens, but just want to mention that because there had been some rumors that maybe they would get split up. I don't think that should happen. I think they should stick together. I talked about Martin Truex Jr. finishing second. You know, way back at the beginning of the weekend, Sunday morning, he was hit with a hefty penalty. They confiscated the team's rear spoiler during pre-race inspection. They were docked 20 points and fined $35,000. Truex was already in a little bit of a points hole, but with that 20-point penalty, he's pretty much in a must-win scenario, even coming into this weekend's race or yesterday's race. So uh, finishing second has to feel pretty good. They played the stages really well. They were really fast, but not winning ultimately has to leave Martin Truex Jr. and that whole team feeling a little little disappointed that they were this close to getting the job done and couldn't quite do it. They're going to need to win Martinsville. And while they did win Martinsville just a few months ago, earlier this summer, that's a tall task here in the playoffs when you got a lot of other hungry drivers that are in must-win scenarios as well. So uh, close, but no cigar for Truex. Alex Bowman finishes in the top five, but unfortunately for Alex Bowman in the round of eight, top fives just aren't good enough if you're already below the cut line coming in. So he also finds himself in a must win. We'll look at the points in just a moment. Solid finishes for Brad Keselowski and Kurt Busch. I'm pretty impressed with Keselowski actually, because this is now two weeks in a row. They had pretty good speed at Kansas last week. Overall this season, I don't feel like Keselowski's been that good at the mile and a half. His bread and butter's really been the one mile and shorter tracks, but here we go. A couple pretty good finishes in a row to start this round. That's That bodes well for his chances of making it to Phoenix. Denny Hamlin struggled a little bit early on, but he ends up finishing ninth, a solid top 10 for Hamlin. That is only Hamlin's third top 10 though in these eight playoff races so far. It has not been a clean and pristine playoffs for the 11 teams so far. Sure, they got that win at Talladega, but they kind of Kind of got away with one there, in my opinion. But overall, they've run pretty mediocre this season, unfortunately. Going to need to turn things around and quick because right now they are really lucky that they were so dang good in the regular season and collected all of those playoff points those first several months because they are certainly not a lock right now to make it to Phoenix for the championship. Joey Logano finishes 10th. He's already headed to Phoenix. Kevin Harvick, you'll remember, slapped the wall on Sunday before the rain here, kind of as the rain hit, you might say. Unfortunately, that damage did turn out to be a little worse than the team originally thought and he was really never, never able to run competitively today. He dealt with a vibration late in the race. He ends up finishing 16th. And then Chase Elliott, poor Chase Elliott, couldn't catch a break. He really just needed a caution in stage three. He was stuck a lap down after when he came to pit road, he left and realized he had a tire going down or something, had to pit an extra time out of sequence, fell a lap down, never got that lap back. So tough break for Chase Elliott there. After looking at those finishing results, now let's look at the point sayings. As you can see, a pretty big gap from fourth on to fifth. So while initially it may look like those top four are pretty locked into the championship race, it's worth noting that a couple of the guys below the cut line are heading to one of their best tracks here in just a few days. Martin Truex Jr., seventh on the playoff grid, won at Martinsville earlier this season. Chase Elliott as well, historically has run pretty dang good at the short track. Chase finished fifth at Martinsville earlier in the season. Both of those drivers are in must-win scenarios. I don't want to discredit Alex Bowman and Kurt Busch. They very well could make something happen Sunday, but my focus really is on Elliott and specifically Truex. And this is why I say Denny Hamlin shouldn't be too comfortable 
comfortable right now. Yes, he's 27 points to the good over Alex Bowman, but he's only two points ahead of Brad Keselowski. If Chase Elliott or Martin Truex Jr. especially wins on Sunday, and Denny Hamlin finishes a couple spots behind Brad Keselowski, which very well could happen. Remember, Denny Hamlin sucked at Martinsville earlier this year. Hamlin could easily see himself being the first guy eliminated if a Truex or Elliott or a Kurt or Alex Bowman ends up nabbing the victory. I'll say it again. Denny Hamlin, who's usually really good at Martinsville, sucked at Martinsville earlier this summer. He finished 24th. I think he was two or three laps down. Remember, he went a lap down before the competition caution. So well, Hamlin and his team completely botched the setup earlier this summer. That could happen again. I, I, I would doubt it, especially given how good Hamlin usually is at Martinsville, but it happened once. It could very well happen again. And given that Hamlin's team has not run particularly well in these playoffs, meanwhile, Truex is coming off a second place run at Texas. Chase Elliott has, has had speed and has won in these playoffs already. I don't know if the momentum, which of course momentum isn't like a real physical thing. It's kind of all just made up, but I don't think he has a lot of momentum. I'd, I'd be a little worried if I was Denny Hamlin right now. One small slip up on Sunday and Denny Hamlin's 2020 season could reach a disappointing conclusion. Going to be a lot to watch at Martinsville, which is only three days away, really. Three and a half, you know, whenever you're watching this. It's this weekend. It's in just a few days. Wow. Short week. Absolutely crazy. There's going to be a lot to watch at Martinsville. Now, let's put Texas on the groovy gauge. I do want to give everyone at NASCAR and everyone at Texas Motor Speedway a lot of credit for managing this weekend, this entire week, the way they did. I mean, they were faced with a, an extremely difficult situation. I was at the track Sunday, and yes, it was cold, and yes, it was just consistently misting from about 4 p.m. on. And it basically misted like that all through Monday and all through Tuesday and even for part of Wednesday. It just wouldn't go away. Again, the radar Saturday afternoon showed that Sunday was going to be 70 degrees and sunny. I mean, I should have screenshotted because it, it was crazy. The forecast was entirely wrong and unfortunately it turned into just a hellacious weekend, it sounds like, for a lot of the drivers and people around the racetrack. Credit to Eddie Gossage and the people at Texas Motor Speedway for managing this weekend the best they could. They announced during the broadcast that Eddie Gossage and NASCAR had teamed up to give all the fans that were able to stay here until Wednesday and come out to support their favorite drivers. They're giving them all hot passes. That's pretty awesome for the all-star race next summer. That is a pretty cool gesture. Hopefully garage access is allowed by next summer. That still remains to be seen. But if you were one of those fans who is going to get a hot pass for next summer's race, check out my video from last year. The first race I ever had a hot pass for was the spring Texas Motor Speedway race date. So if you missed that video from a year and a half ago, like I said, go check it out. It'll show you a little bit of what you can expect with a hot pass at Texas Motor Speedway. Pretty cool facility, really awesome experience. I'm hoping a lot of people take advantage of it. But anyway, yes, the Groovy Gauge. Hello, Groovy Gauge. Good to see you. Just a few days late, but that's that's not your fault. That's that's weather. That's couldn't control that. This race was, ah, it was fine. It was okay. It was really cold out there Wednesday. So interesting, very different conditions from when they raced to Texas in July. I mean, reconfigured, repaved Texas is bleh. This current rules package is bleh. So with all the eh considered, I thought this was a pretty good race. I was very much invested in the finish of this thing, the way it wound up with Kyle Busch leading, trying to extend his win streak. You had Martin Truex Jr. trying to completely destroy the playoff grid. And you also had Christopher Bell, a rookie trying to get his first career win at his race team's home track. That would have been a pretty cool story. So with all the storylines that found themselves near the front of the field at the end of this race, I was very much invested, even though the racing was was just okay. The PJ1 definitely helps at Texas a little bit, but you still have the issue where it was difficult to pass. Texas is really a one groove track. The PJ1 really just makes that groove now the middle lane instead of the very bottom, which isn't a whole lot better. The fuel mileage race at the end was enjoyable. I thought NBC did a fantastic job of playing a lot of the Kyle Busch team radio uh, over the broadcast so that fans who didn't have access to a scanner or something at home were still able to kind of get a feel for the intensity that those drivers were kind of being put through at that moment. I thought that made the broadcast uh, really incredible. So overall, I thought this race was pretty good. You had some wrecks early on. Matt Kenseth, my goodness, guys. I had... I, I've, I've purged all those those thoughts from my mem memory at this point. Oh my gosh. My guy, Matt Kenseth. I mean, I get it. First time in these cars, completely different than anything he's ever driven before. No practice, no qualifying. New team, not as good of a team, of a team as he drove for when he was at Gibbs and things like that. I get it. A lot of the deck was stacked against Matt Kenseth, but... My God, has he been terrible. He's just been really bad. I feel bad for Bubba Wallace fans. He was caught up in Kenseth's mess three laps after they restarted today. Anyway, so there were big wrecks today for fans who... who like some of that spectacle. Good drama all throughout. A lot of parody through the field. Kyle Busch obviously getting his first win of the season was pretty fun, I'll admit. So overall, I'm going to give this race a solid... 
68. 68. That's a weird number, but we're sticking with it. Oh, I should have just done 69. Just completely gone for it. Now we'll stick with 68. We're, we're, it's a clean show. 68 on the groovy gauge. It was, it was a pretty decent race. That's where I stand. Really, I think what made this race was the drivers involved. If the same race had happened, but it was like Kevin Harvick and Denny Ham went the front of the field, I'll be honest, that score is probably a little bit lower. It's probably like high 50s or low 60s. The fact that it was Kyle Busch, who hadn't won all season, had a lot on the line. Martin Truex, who a lot on the line because of the playoffs. Christopher Bell up there, rookie, trying to get that historic win. I think that made this race personally. The fact that those were the storylines battling it out at the very end. Even throw Clint Boyer out there, who was in a weird strategy, but Boyer had a shot at this win as well. And that would have been awesome, given that this is his third to final race of his cup career. That would have been really cool. So I think that really boosted this race in my eyes. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I was on the edge of my seat. It was exciting. 68% for me. Let me know what you guys thought of this race down in the comments below. That's all I've got for this episode, everyone. Thank you for watching. Thanks again to Joe's Hand Cleaner for sponsoring this episode of Out of the Groove. Be sure to subscribe if you are new to the channel. We talk NASCAR almost every single day. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And as always, a huge thank you to my tremendous Patreon supporters. Couldn't do this show without your fantastic support. Not really sure what my schedule is for the rest of this week. I should have a guest coming on the channel here in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but yeah, until then, I will see you all again very, very soon. Have a great rest of your week. Take care, everyone.